So that was, I just thought, well, you know, that's what I would be doing in English. <laughs> <laughs> Something, you know, I'm only for like experiments. I'll be, you know, working with, with, you know, my stuttering and it's very much in that spirit that, you know, that gave me some kind of, let's say, no confidence, but I just thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this experiment, this Ulipo experiment. Uh, someone like Beckett, who uh, switched to French, and thus his logic was to go back to basics, to use language in a, in a very bare, uh, basic way, uh, was someone who was there as well to say, well, it's okay to use language that is not, you know, uh, incredibly sophisticated. You know, you can use language in a very plain way and then do, do other things. Uh, so I started with philosophical toys, a novel. Uh, and I just thought, I have, I'll, I'll have to do other things. So instead of uh, using amazing language, which is not that the language is so bad in my world, but you know, I don't know. Uh, so I thought, uh, okay, I work with rhythm. Rhythm is very important to the novel. It's called rhythm, which, you know, some of my Spanish writing does have that kind of rhythm, so I was seasoned. You know, I was experiencing that kind of thing, building that kind of rhythm. Uh, ideas, I'm going to really work with ideas and put ideas to the foreground. Uh, plot is heavily plotted. You know, my writing before was, yes, it was plotted, but plot wasn't very important. You know, in fact, uh, I wasn't very interested in plot and I do things without plot. You know, it was something that didn't interest me. Whereas with my novel Philosophical Toys, it's just very, very plotted. There's lots of stories happening all the time, lots of, uh, you know, subplots, lots of, uh, lots of different threads happening throughout. So, um, so I started writing and I just thought, right, okay, uh, the narrator cannot be English. The narrator cannot be English. So I made the narrator Spanish, which is what I am. So the narrator is Spanish, uh, and that brought in uh, a whole lot of musings about living between two different cultures, England and Spain, about language, about learning, uh, about learning English, about uh, the the narrator is an artist, and she's a, she's a she's a bit of a writer as well, and she she also muses here and there about uh, her problems with language. That's one of the subplots. The novel is about many things. It's about our relationship with objects. It's about fetishism. But one of the threads that connects all the novel, and that's why Fernando, who read it, invited me to do this talk, is that there's lots of musings on language, and that just happens just because the narrator could not be English. So it opened up, you know, all these other things that I wasn't planning to write about. Uh, I read them there. Uh, I'm going to write, I'm going to read a little bit from philosophical toys. Uh, right, and the, the first line, I'm going to read the first line, Nina, my name is Nina. It comes from Italian, from Antonina. But in Catalan, Nina means those are the first words that I wrote, they came incredibly naturally. It's very interesting because language associations are at the core of the first line. Catalan, I speak, my Catalan is not brilliant, I do speak Catalan, but it's, it's a bit rough. Uh, but 
the first two words of the novel were philosophical choice, the title. And then I called the character Nina. Why? Because in Catalan it means doll. So there's a linguistic association. There's some kind of something happening in my brain. She's called Nina and the name is, you know, I'm happy with the name. Yes, Nina. Why? That's why. Right, I'm going to read and I'm going to stand. I usually read standing. Is this okay? Uh, I'm going to read other bits from the novel. Uh, I, I've just chosen a few paragraphs, and the paragraphs that I've chosen kind of trace one of the threads of the subplots of the novel, which is about language and is about words. And the first bit is she's uh, she's writing in Spanish and she doesn't want to write in English. So she says, words. I love them as much for the meaning as for the music. Love the way they flow together into unpredictable melodies, the pulse, the sound as matter, the texture. I love words in all languages. But above, above all, I love Spanish words. I didn't want to sacrifice my own native language in order to adopt a new one, like some foreigners do, when they slowly strip themselves of their mother tongue so as to fit into their new culture, only to find that they won't fit in. It was a way of clinging to my identity, at least my linguistic one. I became a dictionary addict. There was something disconcerting about looking up the translation of Spanish words into English and vice versa. There were always slippery gaps in the translations, chasms. There was something missing and something extra. One word meant five different words in one language, but it didn't mean half those words in the other. He may have said of other words instead. Words strayed into other words, forming ever-changing constellations. Then I couldn't quite smell English words. I couldn't quite taste their flavour, their emotional environment. To me, Spanish ones always sounded better. My relationship with English was different. It was learnt. It didn't belong to me. It lacked the, tex the texture of years of experience, the texture of a highly subjective dictionary. And then this is towards the end. She's, she's writing in English. So she's made... Um, she's made... The, <laughs> she's made the... You know, there's been a progress. This is one of the little subplots. Um, I know, I know. I write in English, making occasional mistakes with the propositions, unexpected, stupid mistakes. Sometimes, I am sure. I am unsure about the nature of the new words I use, whether a word really means the thing I'm using it for, or whether. It is widely out of tune with all the words around it. There are so many shades to words, so many undercurrents and layers. I'm now aware of the little lies bilingual dictionaries tell. Nuance, atmosphere. Every word is wrapped up in its own atmosphere. Bilingual dictionaries don't give you the nuance of words, their atmosphere. But the first character in the traditore traditore equation. The beauty of giving you the illusion of equivalence, of telling you that a word 
has an equivalent word in other languages when it just doesn't. And I now dream of grasping the atmosphere of words. And I know that in most languages, words can be angelic. But they can also be real rogues. Right. We got a nice audience here, so I wanted to make ask a few questions uh, to our.